All right, so here we have John Fowler, the unenviable task of speaking after these titans of the industry, but John himself is a titan of the industry and has been in the industry probably longer than some of these guys. That's about 15 years now. 15 years. That's a lot of wisdom and experience the audience so. wants to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, before you go, I think <clears throat> when you're talking about the transition of markets, uh, I saw something a few weeks ago that was very powerful. Um, I was actually introduced uh, to Idea City by a friend of mine named Tracy, an activist who recently passed away. Right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dario is wearing a T-shirt that Tracy used oh, fantastic. to hand out. Yeah. Um, I was at Tracy's memorial, and her grower showed up. So Canada's program before commercial cannabis had individuals who grew for patients, and patients like Tracy who couldn't afford their medicine. They effectively ran a drug subsidy program selling the excess. Um, and some of the people on the stage today and many people in my industry criminalize these people. Yeah. Uh, I watched a man who took care of a woman for 10 years growing her cannabis, who had actually never met her before a Facebook post 10 years ago that said, I need a grower, uh, break down and be unable to speak, giving a eulogy because of the connection they built. And it's something uh, I didn't plan to share today, but I've been trying to tell everybody about it because it's important to realize while there's a lot of bad actors in, in that side of the world, there's also a lot of bad actors in legal companies, but there's a lot of fantastic people looking for their way forward and looking for an opportunity. It's good so to mention that I'm thinking also of Michelle Rainey, who Absolutely. used to speak on this stage. Yeah. So. I was fortunate to meet her, she was fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that was a different way to start than I expected. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be back here at Idea City. I had the opportunity to uh, listen for a few years to my friend Tracy that uh, introduced me here. Um, but last year I had an opportunity to come and speak on a very interesting day. The day we were here last year was the day that our parliament granted royal assent for cannabis legalization. And interestingly enough, I was here to talk about a subject that said why I thought legalization was going to fail. So it was a very interesting turn of uh, timing, I suppose. But for me, what was important is I had an abundance of confidence, uh, really, for the last few years, that we would do the act of passing the legislation, that we would get it through Parliament, that we would open stores, that we would do all these things. But I came to speak about what success meant. And to me, success was not passing the law. That's a paper tiger. It's about converting the millions of Canadians who spend billions of dollars of cannabis outside of the regulated market and having them transition into the regulated market. And unfortunately, eight months later, I'm quite concerned I might have been right because we still have only about 20% of Canadian consumers who are spending their dollars on the legal market rather than everywhere else. Um, but today, that's not what I wanted to come here and speak about. Today, what I wanted to speak about is a broader trend that goes beyond Canada. You heard Cam talk about it. You heard Bruce talk about it. It's the global trend of cannabis legalization. It is, to me, the single most exciting global trend that is happening today from an entrepreneurial perspective, from an investment perspective, but I think most importantly from a social perspective, because the global legalization of cannabis, whether it's for medical, recreational, wellness, or let's not forget industrial purposes with hemp, presents an opportunity to impact this world in a positive way that I don't believe there's another trend, another industry, or another invention that can even come close. I meant to have this as a reveal, but uh, for those who saw me last year, uh, my name is John Fowler. I'm the president of the Supreme Cannabis Company. We're one of Canada's publicly traded licensed producers, and I love cannabis. I got into this industry 15 years ago because I really love cannabis. And I am so fortunate every day that I get to wake up beside a woman that I love when I'm not traveling like Cam does and work at a business that not only works for this plant but shares my view that we have an opportunity that's bigger than just the economics. We have an opportunity to be fiduciaries for the plant and fiduciaries for the people that have consumed it, who do consume it, and who will consume it. And we have an opportunity to drive positive impacts from legalization and really improve global well-being. Now, that sounds like a big mouthful. It might sound a little hippy-dippy to some. Uh, but I really think it's true. And I really think that's what's exciting, and that's what underpins the drive of investments, the drive of valuation, the drive of growth, like Cam was talking about, 
with his company is just the idea of legalizing cannabis around the world is an unstoppable global force. And if we do it right, will be one of the biggest ways that we can leave this world a better place than how we found it. And for me, it comes down to three buckets that we need to look at. The products we produce, the investments that we make, and the communities that we build. So starting first with the product, it may not be surprising to some the cannabis industry is based on cannabis. Now, there's a lot of people that want this industry to be based on synthetic molecules and ingredients and things like that. But fundamentally, what we know is that cannabis works. We know that when you combine 90 plus cannabinoids, dozens of terpenes, flavonoids, and other chemicals in a plant, you get what we call flour. You get a product that we recently found out humans have been using for 2,000 years for medical, spiritual, and wellness purposes, and I'm sure a little bit of fun along the way. We know that whole flour products and whole flour extracts have been effective. We've had legal cannabis for medical purposes in this country since 2001. We've had a similar timeline in places like Israel, in places like California, Oregon, and Colorado. We know that these things work. We know that when you make simple extractions from these, extracting all those cannabinoids in their national ratios, that you get effect efficacy, you get enjoyment, and you get a safe product. So at Supreme, our goal when we set out was how to cultivate the best of cannabis in a country where we have some of the world's greatest cultivators at scale. And that was the business problem we wanted to solve because quality and scale don't always go hand to hand. And often you have to sacrifice one to have the other. And I'm very proud of what the team has accomplished in terms of our ability to build one of Canada's favorite brands for high-end cannabis, but also what it means <clears throat> as new products come to market, as we take that beautiful cannabis flower and make products that some of the others in the market won't be able to make. When we talk about cannabis products or 2.0, that you've all heard in the news. We're very excited for the dosage forms. We're excited for vaporizers. We're excited for concentrates and different ways to ingest. But we're excited for products that come from the plant and come from whole flour and bring that benefit forward to the consumer. We're less excited about the molecule products, the commoditized products, and the engineered products that you'll also see this winter that have been created in laboratories to drive better revenue, that have been untested on their, their patients and their consumers, and that the real cost of those products were yet to discover. But products alone don't make an industry. The other part of the cannabis industry that's immensely exciting is our ability to make good investments, purpose-driven investments to make impact. So at Supreme, our flagship facility is seven acres. It's located in Kincardin, north to Barrie, hang a right to Lake Huron. If you haven't been, it's fantastic. It's the sunset capital of the world, and apparently the freshwater surfing capital of the world, which I didn't know was a thing until you see everybody show up in October, put on their dry suits, and go out on the lake. This facility here used to be a tomato facility employing 100 people in the 90s to grow tomatoes and make tomato products. Unfortunately, that business closed, and those jobs were lost. When we purchased the abandoned greenhouse in 2014, we've subsequently invested over $100 million into this community. We have a facility that employs 600 employees on a full-time basis with good pay and benefits. And at our peak, when we were in construction, we had close to 1,000 <clears throat> individuals on site every day, living, working, spending, sleeping, and shopping in Kincardin. That is a huge impact for a community of roughly 20,000 people. It's an impact that's been so big that communities around Canada and even around the world have reached out to our company, asking us to bring a little bit of that development dollars to where they're from. So as someone who spent 15 years in the cannabis space, when the government talks to you about cannabis growing, it's usually a no. It's very strange to pick up your phone and have a government regulator from a local community, from a province, or from a national government say, hey, we'd really like if you could grow weed where we live. <laughs> it's fantastic. And we don't just do things in Ontario or in Canada. We've also had the opportunity to make impactful investments overseas. One of the ones we're most proud of is our investment in a company called Medigrow. Medigrow is located in the kingdom of Lesotho. And as you can see, it's not spelled how it sounds. So if you're Googling it, it's a small landlocked kingdom inside the borders of South Africa. Another beautiful place, great to go to. It's just a little bit more of a journey. We chose to invest here because the investment thesis was fantastic. 
In a world that's rapidly globalizing its cannabis economy, we believe this company will be one of the best and highest volume producers of medical grade cannabis oil, of whole plant oil, that can service the wellness CBD markets and medical markets in places like Africa, uh, like Australia, and predominantly in Europe. But the reason we chose this investment was because they share an alignment that there's a bigger opportunity here, and that as fiduciaries for cannabis and cannabis people, uh, we could do something better. What, they've, what our partners have done here in Lesotho is they've created hundreds of jobs. They've created thousands of indirect jobs, but often for people that have never had employment before. So imagine the opportunity to have your first job ever, maybe the first job in your family, to support 10 or 12 local residents of that, and then to have that employer do things like invest in the local school so the kids there can have access to education, something that as Canadians I think we often take for granted. And we're just getting started as we look at how we can deploy the billions of dollars of capital that this industry has raised, the hundreds of millions that our company has been able to raise. We look for these impacts. We look for the synergies between strong financial performance and positive purpose-driven investment. And there's a laundry list of companies around the world that demonstrate this is a powerful way to be successful. Something that's really interesting, though, is when these two things come together. When you start to create fantastic products that people love, when you start to improve well-being at the consumer level, giving people an op option as an alternative to alcohol or tobacco or pharmaceuticals, and when you invest with purpose to drive positive well-being and to make the world a better place, you start to build communities. And this is something that has been one of the most rewarding parts of working in cannabis. So there on the screen is part of our community of our team in Kincardine. Interestingly enough, this was a year ago, and that's less than half of the people that currently work there. The community we built there is 600 employees who come to work every day to work hard and focus on a goal of producing this country's best cannabis flower. We have a workforce that's predominantly under 25 years old. We have a workforce that is majority female, and we have a leadership team that's incredibly diverse in professional background, gender, age, and origin. That's something that we're proud of. It's just the beginning, but it's a good start. What we're very proud of is we have managers that have never been managers before, young people who come to us for training, who learn how to manage other people, and we watch them transform, not just as employees, but as people. We watch them grow up. We watch them dress different. We watch them speak differently. We watch with that idea of purpose and fulfillment that comes not just from having a job, but having a hard job, and having a job that you feel fulfilled at when you go home at the end of the day, and it transfers into your social life. It transfers into your local community, whether it's your family or your friends or whoever that is. And that's something that we're very proud of. That's a community that we're building with Seven Acres in Kincardine. With Medigro in Lesotho, we're building a community where employment and investment is allowing opportunity that used to not be there in that part of the world. <clears throat> it's allowing better education. It's allowing better access to facilities and water and things like that. Again, things we take for granted, but that we're able to help provide while creating a business that we expect to be a global leader. Within our shareholder base, and we have about 70,000 of them, we've been able to create opportunities. Some of the most rewarding phone calls we get are people who call me often for one or two reasons. One of the reasons is they like to tell me what their investment in Supreme or in cannabis has been able to do for them. You know, whether that's new opportunities at home, sending the kids to college, paying down debts. You know, obviously investments are risky, and I'm sure my lawyer doesn't like me saying this, but the stories are powerful. The other one we get is just an opportunity to participate in an industry that's been maligned. An industry that's been pushed into the shadows, that's been stigmatized and criticized. And what's amazing to me is the number of cannabis consumers and cannabis activists that find their way to participate through investment. Cam Batley touched on an interesting point before he left around amnesty. I'm a big believer in amnesty, I'm a big believer in expungement, but I believe while we wait for those governments to do their thing, it's very important that we act as businesses today and provide opportunity for those who have criminal records with cannabis. <laughs> We're very proud that at Seven and Acres and at Supreme, we have a number of employees who have criminal records for cannabis. 
while we wait for the government to get rid of their records, we were able to have a mature conversation and say, you know what? You work for this plant, but you're a good person. You want to work legally in the industry. What better employee for us to give a second chance to than a business where our entire business, cannabis as a whole, is being given a second chance? These These are some of the ways that we try to pair economic success, financial performance, shareholder returns, all the things we have to think about being a publicly traded company with the size and scope that we have, with making sure that we make the world a better place through cannabis legalization, and making sure we maximize the positive benefit that can come from legalization. And I want to leave you with a thought here before I run out of time. I got into cannabis about 15 years ago. At that time, almost 100% of people in the world lived where cannabis was criminalized completely. Almost 100% of people in the world back then, and it's not that long ago, I'm a pretty young guy, lived in a place where not only was it criminalized, penalties were often severe. Penalties were often um, life sentences, things of that nature, and even in a number of companies, penalties could include death. Today, if you look at this map, you can see there is an undisputable move starting in Canada and spreading through the rest of the world to rethink prohibition, to recognize that it has failed, that it has not achieved a government objective, and it's clamped down on commerce, entrepreneurship, and opportunity around this plant, and it's held back that positive benefit that we're unlocking with legalization. I believe by the time I retire that almost 100% of people in this world will have some form of access to cannabis, whether medical, wellness, recreational, or industrial hemp. And I think that's fantastically exciting, and it should be exciting for you in this room as well. But it's very important that as we have this change, and I think uh, somebody mentioned today, the industry will only ever get bigger, and these are true, but we need to remember that the positive impact of cannabis is not guaranteed. Hemp can be grown in environmentally stable ways. It can also be commercially farmed in environmentally disastrous ways. Hemp plastics can be bioavailable, biodegradable, but they don't have to be. Cannabis flower products can be healthy, safe, and effective as social substances or as medications. They can also be pharmaceuticalized, created in new formulations in the lab where the health and safety risks are untested, and sadly, we've seen through some of these synthetic products negative health effects that we don't see with whole flower products. When we look at the evolution of our industry, the capital market, the financial, the economic opportunity is robust. But I think the bigger opportunity is to use that as a platform for positive social change, for maximizing the positive benefit of cannabis, and for making sure that when we leave this place, we leave it better than we found it. So I haven't asked for everybody here today. I hope that I've given you something that makes you want to look a little bit deeper into cannabis, whether it's Supreme or anybody else. I hope that you choose products that are whole plant, that provide that benefit of cannabis to you or to consumers around you. And I hope that you choose to support companies that are in it, not just for the economic opportunity, but also for this opportunity to turn global legalization into one of the most powerful and transformative forces for global change of our lifetimes. Because you know what? We can do better, and at least at our company, we will do better. And if you guys push us hard enough, we'll have to do better. Thank you.